I've always been quite uh, outspoken, I guess. Um, you know, it's probably why I was un- became unemployable, basically. Squeegee and Ink Podcast Season 2. This podcast is sponsored by Blind Maggot, Magna Colors, Screen Print World, Target Transfers, and Adobe Creative Suite. I'm Tom, and I uh, run a business called Make Ready. So we're a fine art silk screen printing studio. Uh, we, we also do digital printing as well. We, we really embrace that um, side of it. I guess we'll come on to that later. But um, yeah, we were based in Tottenham. We were based in um, Kentish Town. Um, before that, it was in my garage uh, wow. in South East London about just over six years ago. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of grown like quite rapidly um, from uh, yeah, singular vision, really, which was just to make really great fine art prints and really push the boundaries of what you could do and uh, and not in the sort of classical sense um we were you know we're very obsessed with with industry and and, and all those kind of old heads you know and, and mm. talking to the people who make emulsion that make ink and actually they're the really special people that have kind of kind of done it all before and it's just mm. kind of lost generationally perhaps um so that's what we do and we, yeah, we specialize working with um many international artists um it was a lot in the uk but now it's kind of gone worldwide, which is amazing. So, um, you know, we work with people from all over the world. We just did a big project with Ai Weiwei, which was mm. like a bucket list moment. Mm. Um, we've worked with, uh, yeah, all sorts of people. I could list, a, I won't list everyone, but yeah. um, we've done a lot of cool stuff in the short time that we've existed. Um, and now we've partnered extremely closely with um with uh, basically, who was our best client? Yeah, <laughs> uh, this company called Avon Art, um, mm. who you know we we really think is kind of an antidote, if you will, to the status quo. And I think we are as well to the fine art print scene in the world. Yeah, and, um, yeah we just we now make about ninety five percent of their prints, which is um, a real pleasure. Yeah. Um, working very closely with them as well. So that's kind of the business in a nutshell. And yeah, you know, there's about thirteen of us. Uh, it's incredible. It's incredible expansion and growth. And and then to just grow last year into that even bigger space, like, yeah. do, you, do, do you feel that you've got that assurance from working with Avant Arts that you've got the client base and that's how you're confident enough to grow that quickly, do you think? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we're very close businesses. Like we're actually, you know, very, very intertwined, um, mm. you know, in a, in a corporate way. Um, but we're still separate entities. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's how we moved, right. You know, is, you know, we, we work so close with them and they basically said, you know, look, we, uh, you know, do your thing, <laughs> but perhaps yeah. a bigger scale. I mean, that's kind of, I can't go into all the details, but yeah, there's a security working with them. Obviously I think like struggles of having, I've had other small businesses and like, mm. you know, as I'm sure you're aware, like it's tough, you know, <laughs> it's so yeah. hard. And I think what we were doing as well was, you know, like my, I work with my partner, actually, like she, um, I met her at work <laughs> Funnily enough, now we, we live together and, um, but, uh, you know, she'll tell you that you know, there were really sort of dark days when we were just chasing money mm. all the time. Mm. And she was just, she would, I mean, she could kill me a few times <laughs> Yeah, because I would be like, <laughs> we have to do the best print ever. <laughs> and, uh, I found this amazing machine, which allows us to do it. Uh, and I've spent all the money, um, <laughs> but no, I think, you know, uh, because we had that kind of vision, you know, now having, and found, and found someone so kindred with that one art who are also about those principles, but, uh, I mean, that business was set up by some fantastic individuals who, um, mm. you know, a lot more about, uh, business than I do, uh, cause I never set out to, to be a business owner. Yeah. You know, to, so uh, you said you, this is like your, you've had different iterations of businesses, but they all in this kind of like art sector or like what were the other ones? And like, um, why do you think this one's become successful? Um, yeah. I had one where I sold plants and like terrariums. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I guess I, that has been successful, but someone else kind of really made that successful. I was just kind of there at the beginning and, you know, I was, I didn't really like retail and things like that. So mm. I guess for me, that was like a failure. Uh, not for the actual person who went on to take that quite far. Um, I, yeah, I guess my heart wasn't like super in it. Um, and then there's been other iterations of like printing that I've done. Yeah, it's all just been in screen printing and it's mm. just kind of got it wrong. And I met for a couple of other guys and that kind of failed. And and then and then I, w- and then I went to work at a fine art printmaker for about a year. 
yeah. uh, one of the ones um, in the UK, the big ones in the UK. So yeah, I think they failed because I just have no, I just had no idea like what I was doing. Yeah. But I think the core thing is is that we always had a really good product. Like mm. there was, it was unquestionable that we were breaking down loads of doors and people were like these kind of bigger names or at the time they were big names were coming to us and just emailing us and being like, Oh, can we visit the studio? And I was like, Oh, it's under renovation. It's like, yeah. in my carriage. Yeah, it really, <laughs> um, yeah. That's we had really a funny. pentagram actually. And I did all these prints for this woman called Marina Willow. And one of the people we were working for, her was like, can we go and see them? And we're like, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, that's really right. funny. Um, I've I've done a very like minuscule amount of uh, compared to you, like fine art printing, and I never found the artists difficult to work with. I found the art studios that kind of controlled the artists difficult <laughs> because if if I felt like if I had that communication directly with the artist, then we can talk like as artists together, and I could be like, well. I, I know this is how you're trying to basically what I'm saying is that the studios want you to replicate the yeah. artwork in an identical like way. Are you bringing something as a silk, uh, as a screen printer and like adding to the artwork or are you always trying to replicate? That's quite, uh... no, I, I love that question. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, um, it's probably the same in the music industry. Like I know people in the music industry and they, and they, you know, it's always the A&R people. Mm, <laughs> that yeah. Always, I mean, obviously you get, you know, frustrating artists, like, you know, humans are corrupt in, in many ways, but, <laughs> but you're right. Yeah. Actually, like we always strive to speak directly with the artists. Like there's a guy, mm. Mark Aldridge, actually, who we've done a lot of work with and we're doing some more stuff with him now. And, um, you know, we're so close when we work together. He's actually really helped shape the studio in a way mm. so particular, but yeah, you, you get so much done. Like, I mean, if you look at it on like a, uh, if you've measured it by a metric, a metric of like communication and messages, I say, mm. if you do it by email, like it literally takes longer because the gap <laughs> is longer mm. and there's this kind of miscommunication. And obviously, you know, the, the worst thing is when someone takes something a photo on their phone and go, Oh, it's like this. And I'm like, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know? um, but we, no, we, we definitely, um, yeah, I agree with you. Like always the studios that are around it definitely. And they want to make like a repro you know, repro graphic or something. Um, but I feel now like we had a bit of a problem before where we maybe didn't have as much clout. Mm. We kind of had to agree all the time. Like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. And like, you know, I just got us, I mean, I say I, cause it was really me. I got us some real tangles cause I want yeah. to please all the time. Mm. And actually I learned like the best thing. So the worst thing you can do is actually just agree with everything they say, because now we've got a bit more clout and we've got this great portfolio and we've worked with all these artists. I think people come to us and I always use this analogy you know, it's like an artist or a music artist comes and they go, they've got the album, they've got the track, they've got the guitar, they've got the drums, but like we're the record producer, like we can make a hit. Mm. We can, we know how it should sound. Mm -hmm. And and also that's the same with the, the visuals, obviously with our printing, like we know how it should look. Yeah. We see your artwork and we go, this type of color separation, is going to be really good. Like we had this guy, Christian Rex Van Minen, we did this kind of crazy weird face with these gummies and it was super 3D. But I think oh, just... is that way like he puts all the little details on the gummies by hand afterwards? Is it that guy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, I think he does it. Um, well, he pay, he's like a painter. So he does like yeah. dust and master's painting. We did a print of his and it looks completely 3D. Mm. And it's insane. And I got so many messages actually on, on Instagram when we put it on. But, you know, his involvement in that was actually very low because mm. I think there was a massive trust with Avant Art and and this guy, you know, this artist to say, you know, do your thing. Like, and we were like, we really think it should look like X. Mm. And I think you should just let us get on with it basically. Yeah. Uh, in, in much polite terms. And, and, and it was a very successful thing. Um, so yeah, no, there's, it's a real mix. It's a real mix. Yeah. There's so many like different avenues that I could start talking to you about. Like there's like the, the very technical screen print bit. So you said that you worked for another gallery and did you find all your technical abilities in like how to make choices about meshes and inks and curing and stuff from your practical experience there? Or uh, do you think yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, no, so <laughs> I, I won't divulge, you know, names, but like I worked at a relatively a very well-known screen printer in, in, in South East London. Um, and I spent about a year there and I basically learned, nothing i learned how to be in a tough environment and like mm. be around artists maybe but like 
Um, you know, I, th- I think what struck me when I started Make Ready after leaving this place was, um, you know, like, I, you know, I got to this top place and I was like, oh my God, like amazing. And I, I, you know, my friend actually put it really well, you know, he was like, oh, you were like Sonic with his rings. I kind of was running a thousand miles mm. down and it just like went bling like this because I, I had, you know, I realized that no one there could actually really explain to me what's happening. Yeah. Why they're doing what they're doing. Like mm. actually and, you know, and there's a converse argument, which is, um, oh, if you get, you know, we all can't, you, you read too many books, you, you become uncreative. Uh, I completely disagree. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you do need to know. And so, so, so no, basically, um, when we, when I started Make Ready, I kind of just started making inroads with um, people in the, like I say industry, as not people make ink, like people who made me- like mesh, you know, people who are manufacturers of machinery. I went on loads of forums of like old school, like lithographic printers of like retired and just writing about how they color separated because I felt that like, especially in fine art printmaking, the script screen mm. printing, that so many things have been forgotten. And there's this kind of look like you only have to go to the London original print fair Mm. And like, you just see the same Peter Blake print in like five of the booths mm. Mm. and they all just like, everything kind of has this same kind of look. And I knew that screen printing, uh, as, as sure you, you know, it can look like any other process. Like that's the yeah. cool thing about it. Yeah. Isn't? That's the replication side of it, isn't it? Like the, mm. Exactly. Like we, you know, I remember people telling me like, oh, UV inks, like, um, oh, it's cheating or like, oh, it's just really plasticky and it looks wrong. And I was like, well, I'm going to go and try it. And like, <laughs> so wrong yeah. like mm. uv ink is the best thing that's ever happened to us like it's way better for the environment you use what you use you don't have to have like a massive fountain you can push the dot so fine mm. like we print through this 180 26 mesh uh, we have that specially brought in that's incredible uh, <laughs> that's stressing me out i bought like it, i, it I used to dries. do 120 and it stressed me out yeah <laughs> it, it, it wow. never dries, right you know mm. And we moved into like, um, like, co- like how to coat a screen and really properly, like, you know, mm. and, and what, what, what does EOM mean and, and, and RZ and, and like, again, we kind of got a bit of flack from people who were like, well, you know, we didn't need that. Mm. You know? And, but the reality is I think, you know, if anyone listened to this podcast, go and look at this Christian Rex van Linden print we did, because I think that's such a culmination of six years of, um, mm. so it's answer that kind of first question. We did really learn it ourselves. Like we had to go back to basics and just mm. kind of learn it from the ground up. Like I knew what a squeegee was. I knew how to keep a press running in a strict, cause it could be stressful. Right. Mm. And we wanted to de-stress it and say, you know what, this can't be it. Like this, yeah. this can't be screen printing. So we moved away from like water-based inks and we went with like more solvent inks where we could have like retarders and you really control the, you know, the, the, the kind of um, fluidity and the viscosity of the ink and the rheology of the ink. And mm. then also someone into UV and I'll tell you what, UV, will, I will live t- 10 more years. Yeah. <laughs> it's never dries, you know. I, re- I really wanted to ask you about that as well, because you've got one of the UV Cura lights and like, how, how do you do that? Like, do you, do you, do you hover it over the prints or... Yeah, you've we, got an amazing machinery in that new studio, haven't you? Yeah. So we, the way we started doing that was, you know, you, the thing about UV is it's, um, it's, it's prohibited. You know, I say, oh, it's great. You just, you just go and buy it and you use it. It's brilliant, right? You must have uh, a very mm. large machine to cure it correctly. Mm. But before we could do that, before we could basically demonstrate to uh, any investment and, and build an investment case for this equipment, we kind of had to do it with uh, you know any means that we had so we made a few prints this guy jackie Sai, and it was this one of these puppets and it looked beautiful it's like 50 colors and i had to basically figure out how we were going to use this led uv curable link because i knew that was like the gateway to prove that this works and it has mm. better you know um it works better for our workflow and stuff so i went on to alibaba and i basically found <laughs> made a um and it was for curing uh, uh nails you know for yeah college and i messaged them and said could you make this uh, 1.6 meters and i just got this reply from someone called wendy yeah Not her name. Always, i've got three yeah. wendy's on alibaba and yeah. she just said yes and uh and then she, and then she said it'd be 700 quid yeah she yeah. made an item that was one pound and said put in quantity 700 and we'll send it to you wow and i was like oh my god cat is just gonna murder me like if i, <laughs> I just bought some magic bought some magic beans anyway it arrived and it worked, but it, we had to basically can cure it. And it was mm. so slow. It was so slow. But one of the things about Make Ready is that 
we really adapt and overcome. Like we we don't go, oh man, you know, this is like so so we were like, you know what, we'll we'll optimize and we'll get 10% better every week or every month. And now we have seven of these massive nat graph who uh, tunnel dryers mm. layers. Um and, and they have a warm air module for curing evaporation drying inks like water based and solvent. Mm. And they have a UV curing module uh, where you can really change the settings and they actually emit the wavelength of light um, that cures standard UV ink. Mm. Um, and, and that's been a game changer because you can get the mattest matte, you can get the glossiest gloss. You know, we're, we're varnishing prints through 165 meshes. That's, that's mm. not 140s and that's a low mesh, you know, for UV. Mm. Uh, the control you have is is insane and uh it's allowed us to do so much and be so creative through that yeah so that's that's that is incredible like how did you when you were in your garage were you already on like an automatic machine or were you ever hand pulling it oh not hand pulling it but you know pulling it with a yeah. with a bar like yeah was the um, setup? that's a good question and it also i guess it leads me on to like a point which is probably one of many of my unpopular opinions. <laughs> I really like, oh like, yeah, I love that one. Comments at the end, but, um, <laughs> yes, definitely. I, I, I learned screen print by hand, like absolutely. Um, and I had a, I had an arm, you know, I had a printing arm uh, in my garage, and I had a, I had to mallet the dry dock in every time, so it, so it, um, registered, and it was freezing cold in there. And then I got a Kipax, you know, bench, and uh, I actually got a, in. It was years ago. I got the tattoo of their like old 1950s logo on my leg. <laughs> I actually got us some discount when we invested. So it's really, it's a tattoo. I don't have any. T- I don't have any other tattoos, and I probably never will. But it was a great oh. decision. Uh, <laughs> and now we know them quite well, and it's quite cool. But um, so yeah, then we moved. So the reason that we kind of moved on to semi-automated is none of them is automatic. It's, it's mm. fully automatic. It's semi-automatic. And yeah, like there's definitely this uh, kind of zeitgeist where like, oh, it takes craft out of it. Um, you know. Yeah, I disagree. Like I completely disagree. I think like if you, it's like saying all electronic music is cheating. Mm. Like you know, it's like the London uh, electronic orchestra, or the London contemporary orchestra. Sorry, they have all these electronic instruments. You know, um, they're automated. You know, there there are. Big, you know, I think music that is to a click is really good. I think it's the same with this. Like so, basically, we were doing loads of great prints by hand, and we were getting very very good. And particularly this um, some of the people who work in business, like Felix and Amy, who are amazing, by the way, um, they were getting very, very good and we were really, really tight with it. But you know what? Like, it was tough and mm. just making sure the impression was the same every time. And we were like, we're so good at this that we want to grow the business. We want to be able to yeah. give careers to our staff, you know. And one of those things that underpinned all that growth was um, semi-automated. So if we want the squeegee to do exactly the same thing every time, someone may say, I'll oh, take the craft and the love out of it totally disagree you become the voyeur you, you, mm. witnessing the press and you are very much in control of the machine there's if you set out wrong it will do it wrong mm. every time yeah now, the thing about hand bench is yeah you can kind of stretch it and distort it and you know you, you, it's in the fingertips mm. when you play the orchestra of you know like a, a semi-automated bench the things you can do, it's got peel off settings as well. So as it prints, the back peels up, you know, so you can do these very wide format prints, you know, and, mm. and really control the parameters. And you must be a very good printmaker to a um, hand printmaker to use one. And I'll tell you what, some of the things that we can do now in the control, the, the registration, mm. just insane. Yeah. But, um, all the same problems are there as your ink dries, your mesh will drag more. You know the, the machine is bigger, so you have to kind of like make tricky ways to get around it, and mm. you know um, it fails. It has more parts that can fail, so you actually end up becoming an engineer, like yeah. engineers. But we do know these machines very well, like um, Kipax. Funnily enough, I speak to them quite a bit when they because they installed a lot of our studio, and uh, they got to the point where we were we were ringing them, and we were kind of self diagnosing, and then fixed, yeah. and they joked and said, maybe we'll just send you out to the next, or not me, but, you know, my friend Felix at work, uh, to the next um, on-site visit in London <laughs> because you, yeah. know, you guys could fix it. So, um, yeah, semi-automated is is, is brilliant. Um, I mean, yeah, I've seen them in, in T-shirt presses as well. I mean, it must make people's lives a lot easier putting down white. <laughs> yeah, so. it does. It does. I don't think it's as, like, you've got, like, as much finesse or, like, that kind of, like, artistic thing as what you've got with an automatic press because mm. you do get people whose job it is just to load the T-shirt and they, uh-huh. again, know nothing about 
they just brought in load the t-shirt take the t-shirt off and then somebody else is in charge of the press but i do like your metaphor with the being the conductor of the orchestra and Mm -hmm. i do understand that and i haven't used an automatic press for um yeah printing artworks but um yeah I, i I do think it would be amazing. And then at the end of the press run, you wouldn't actually literally have sweat pouring onto yeah. your print. <laughs> I mean, you will, <laughs> Which, I, you longer, like, I know it sounds crazy, but yeah. like, you know, you will not have repetitive strain injury when you're 50. Mm. You know, um, no, and, uh, yeah, I, I see what you mean. Like a guy who I used to work with, you know, he's worked in a big, he's a bit older and he's worked in a big fully automatic presses and things. Yeah. And you do get those kind of jobs where you're loading it on like in a factory um you know and but with these machines because the thing about you know t-shirt automatic machine is made for printing t-shirts and it's mm. you know, mnr and those companies they're so amazing you know but like tima who this german company um which is uh all the all the kipax semi-automated equipment by the way is, is tima stuff licensed to them right. <laughs> um but they these machines are made for making an impression onto mm. a substrate mm. that happens to be underneath the thing so the settings are almost infinite. You can change everything about it. There's a touchscreen, like everything is customizable. So, you know, you cannot, you have to be very, very skilled to know mm. what's going on and and, yeah. you, and really have to have done a bit of hand printing, definitely. So, yeah, it's very, uh, it's very artistic, actually. Uh, it's super creative. You know, some of mm. the challenges that we have, especially across very wide formats, um, really do make you have to understand. Like one of the first things, we do when people join is we give them this little book that we get from, um, from I think it's from uh, Keywell, um, or oh, sorry, Cifar, who make Me- who make Armesh. Mm. Um, and it just talks about the basic fundamentals of screen printing and like mm. the image that you print through the mesh is not a one-to-one replication of the film. You know, it's a distortion of the film and the screen, you know, and everything is to do with the parameters of that day and, and the tension and, and the, and, and the dynamic angle of the squeegee and you know i think it's just getting people to understand that like actually it's really complicated but we mm. will find a way through and you will learn and you have to kind of go back to basics yeah um, and about i think the, the path the battle as well as you know one thing like i said that maybe is birthed from basically not being able to have a conversation with people who are making these really difficult prints and actually explain it Mm. Um, I think some people say you, you don't need to explain art. So I think, and when you're making art and trying to scale a business, I think you do. Yeah. <laughs> you have to know because you want to do it again. Um, and a big thing for us is we really always get the printers to like build a vocabulary of like what's happening behind the squeegee. You know, oh, it's not going well. It's like explain. You know, what's happening? Like, was did this happen after you did that? If this, then you know, there's a bit of a scientific method there. So. Um, yeah, those are really sort of core foundations for our, yeah. for our team, really. Yeah. Um, I think, like, just what you said earlier is that you're getting this information from the manufacturers, the ink, the ink people, mm. the mesh producers. Does that mean that you're finding it difficult to communicate and get information from the other printers? Are they quite guarded in their um, methods and secrets and stuff? Yeah. Um, I yeah, found them. They were I'm trying uh, to even yeah, figure out what, where the diamond dust is. It's just uh, yeah. insane. I'll tell, you, I'll tell everyone here. <laughs> um, yeah, so, piss a lot of people yeah. <laughs> But basically, um, yeah, no, I I love that question because I I do feel quite strongly about it. To be honest, as you know, I'm so yeah. Sorry, talking to the mesh manufacturers and stuff. Like, I think just answer that part of the question quickly is that it's not that any of them really told us how to do it. It's just they like, we've got this, like, mm. great conversations, like just like hour and a half, two hour long conversations about mesh. Mm. And then there'd be that one thing that they'd say. And I go, Ooh, and I mm. don't go back to Felix at work and go, you know, I was talking to this guy or this woman and, and they said this, I'm like, that's didn't, didn't we sort of observe that with, mm. you know, it wasn't as if like I went to Kip Axe and go, how do you make a print? Mm. You just get these people talking and you open them up, you know, and they, mm. and they just have, they, but they won't even be aware of it. They'll just give you that massive eureka moment that they'll just throw that curveball at you and you'll catch it and think, yes, okay, amazing, you know. Um, and then the other, yeah, the other part of the question about the other printers, um, I think there is a really big problem in the UK mm. with guardedness. So in America, in New York, I went there a few years ago and I saw this guy, Luther, he's a really cool guy. I went drinking with him, like took us out, super cool guy, met a few other people as well. You know, the first thing he did, got this, hey man, how you doing? Like, it's really cool to see you. Like, you should go see this place. You should go see this place. You should go meet this person straight away. He was mm-hmm. like, yeah, you should do all these things. And 
in the UK, it is not like that. I know. Everyone is, <laughs> I mean, you doing the same thing. And I, I think it's really bad. And I think people are afraid of losing their business. But the irony is, is that if we don't share things, yeah. our industry will, is and will die. So mm. Diamond Dust is a perfect example. I had this with glitter. Mm. And I had someone wouldn't tell me where they got it from. I was like, dude, you know, at the time I was going to start, you know, I was about to start a business. And I thought like, mate, like I'm going to find out. Like yeah. I'm going um, to ring NASDAQ. I'm going to ring Marabou. And they're going to tell me someone in Europe where I get it from. And it's Ronald Britain is where you buy the best <laughs> glitter. And a place called Plowdens in the UK is where you buy <laughs> the best diamond dust. And if you don't tell people, mm. you'll inspire them to to just not talk to you again. Yeah, and you might even like get a little bit of sabotage out of them. So if yeah. they hear that you've got a job as well, you're like, well, I think I'll take yeah, that one. Exactly. Not that you've got it in you to be evil, Tom, but I'm just saying like, it's just, there's no need for it, is there? Do, no. you, think it's, do you think it's a generational thing? I think it's, a, yeah, I think in fine art, I guess like some of the old, maybe some of the older studios are controlled by a different generation. Yes, I don't really know what it is. I feel like there is... I mean, I basically stopped going to private views. I stopped going to, um, I basically unfollowed on Instagram <laughs> everyone in the UK, just everybody. And it made my mental health way better. Mm. And that's when we really began to soar because we didn't need the recognition. Like, I think what, I think we've ruffled a few feathers, I must say, but I think what probably frustrated people is that we just never needed the recognition of the usual mm. suspects. Like, yeah. We just never needed to be seen at the London Vision Print Fair, we never needed to be seen at the, you know, any, do you know what I mean? Like we didn't need a recognition of like certain galleries. We were just like, no, you're okay. You're all right. Like we're just going to do it. And then people just started to come to us and also a whole new generation. And why I'm not advertising Avant Art here, but like why they're so exciting and the, and the people who work at that company are so exciting because they are basically a tech company. I'll tell you what, who I really love and I'm really inspired by is Coriander Studio. I mean, they're, they're brilliant. You know, they, they've been around for so long. And and the people that I've met, like, very briefly, I've spoken to this guy, Greg, there. And I've, I've spoken to a guy, Ed, there. And they're just the nicest people you can imagine. Mm. And they also seem, in a similar sense, I think we were very inspired by them because they kind of didn't, they kind of just ignored everything that was going on. They just kind of, well, from, from my perspective, they just kind of did what they needed, they wanted to. And everyone was always talking about Coranda this, Coranda that. And I was such a victim that I probably said their name every 20 words mm. at the beginning of Make Ready. And I think it's important to have. Yeah, know, it is. An idol, you know? Yeah. But now, um, now we feel with, with Avon Art, particularly that we are carving a new future for fine art printmaking. You know, we mm. are very much a digital embracing digital methods you know um even for our staff i think the package and, and proposition that we mm. offer as a career or we're sort of tr- trying to grow this is much more um modern you know um than a lot of these other places so yeah um but yeah no it's it's there are some great places out there you know um, luther in new york and, and coriander particularly are massively inspirational yeah, because it is going to go even further than just embracing digital soon. I, I imagine lots of artists are going to try and integrate, like, you know, they're going to layer on actual experiences onto the artwork with mm. like virtual reality and things like that, that only you can experience once you've seen the image. Yeah. Um, We've done a bit of that, actually. Yeah. Mm. A guy, Jackie Sai, he did a lot of like augmented reality in his prints. We're now working... Uh, with a lot of NFT artists who mm. are like very big NFT artists as well. Like I, I met a few of them and like actually just the most humble people. Um, a guy, Tyler Hobbs recently, is just like the most nice guy, mm. <laughs> uh, but you know, he just like doesn't strike you as someone who's, you know, made a lot of money in the art world basically. Um, but people who, you know, we're working with other NFT artists who um, make physical things. So we're doing these prints with this guy in because, and he does generative art and it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, actually like I NFTs you know I wasn't so fast I respected them and, um, but now like some of these guys are really interested in making um, you know physical work and, and yes. we're, we're right there to make it with them and, and explore that with them and yeah. um, I think I think the thing about digital and NFTs and AI and you know and, and, and the old as well is that you know I think businesses like ours we don't make enemies of the past or the future you know, they, they go hand in hand, you know, there mm. is like, well, it used to be better in my day because we did everything by hand. It's like, well, yeah. 
but the thing is, you know, Warhol was using the best technology and the most advanced technology he had at that time. Mm. That's what he was doing. Like, and so that's what we're doing, you know. That's really, that's um, a really nice way of thinking about that, actually. Yeah. Yeah, definitely respect that. Um, can, can you talk about like very basic decisions and like ways that you can guide artists? So things like, if someone brings you a piece of work and it's been originally like hand painted like an oil painting or something, and you're like, I think this will be a better silk screen. Uh, sc- do you still call them silk screens just because artists tend to call screen print silk screens? But yeah, I guess we, I just started yeah. falling into that habit. Yeah. yeah. I, it was we, a way of differentiating ourselves as well, like branding wise. Everyone called it screen printing. So I thought, yeah, well, silk screen, then yeah. you know, we can handle that. Yeah. Uh, would you like, when do you? guide them between like doing a, a screen print or a digital print and like is that a decision you're making with the artist and like what would what would sway you either way um i, I budget <laughs> is a big yeah all oh, right okay um you know obviously like if someone we're working with an artist um i mean it's a, it's it's a good thing now like basically we're at the point now where like if if you're having a conversation with us your audition will probably sell out mm. um but we might not, you know, it might, there might not be the budget for you to do, you know, a 30 color silk screen. Cause most of the screen printing we do now as well, like one great, yeah, thing, about, <laughs> part, yeah. one great thing about partnering with, you know, having art is that, you know, we kind of, the, we kind of got rid of a lot of the, the faff, you know, like mm. we did great digital prints, which are really accessible. Like, you know, um, we did one for this Japanese artist called Ayaku Rukaku. Um, and, you know, it was like 500 euros, you know, and we saw, I think it was about 4,000 of them in a, wow. in an evening or something uh, or in 24 hours. But then like she had paintings on me, like, uh, sorry, her prints on me like five grand, you know. Um, so, but that was really good because that, the budget was there for that. And we actually worked with her on the print. She came over and, and, and we just tweaked some colors, but then we might have a smaller edition like this guy, Christian Rex for or someone like Miles Aldridge. Um, where, you know, we will, you know, Miles, he absolutely wants to do a screen print. He's very aware of it. Christian, you know, we could have probably done a digital print and it would have Mm. looked great and it would have looked great as a JPEG on our Instagram. And, you know, and, but the thing is, is that we want to make people's heirlooms, you know, Mm. and and this print is sold for much more, Uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit high value. There's a budget there for it. So it, it is, you know, there is a commercial line that's drawn through everything, most certainly. Because that's how you scale the business, but um, you know, we often will. We even though we absolutely love screen printing, we will be the first people to say, "Why do you want to make a screen print? Like, mm. is this the right thing to do?" Because we we have had it before, and we we've made a lot of mistakes where we've said, "Yeah, yeah, we'll do a screen print. It's gonna be amazing." And someone's just got like a bit of a different, maybe more romantic idea of what it is, you know, like mm. Chuck Close working with Brand X in New York, doing 150 color silk screens, but they, they can't visit the studio, you know, and we can't be there with them and it's all done on email and, and it's just not quite right, you know? Mm. Um, and so, yeah, we will guide people very heavily and we are actually now very opinionated. You know, we will say, we think this is just going to be the best solution for you. Um, and often with artists, we will, We'll make a program. I mean, this guy mm. Miles, you know, when we first came, well, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, yeah, we'll do whatever you want. You know, and now he's asking us, what do you think? You know, I've got this idea. What do you think about it? Tell me your honest opinion. And, and that's a much better way of working, I think. Yeah. The worst thing you can do is agree with everything they say. <laughs> <laughs> but like, how, how did you switch out of that? Because like I switched out of it in maybe like a week and I, I just hit a wall and then I realized I'm doing what you said at the beginning, like I'm people pleasing, I'm reacting to what everyone else wants. Like, was there a, was there like a tipping point for you where you, where you just like came across this like barrier and you thought I have to change my mentality or like, was it your confidence grew? And then that meant that you could have your own voice. I think I've always been quite, uh, <laughs> spoken, I guess, um, you know, it's probably why I was un- became unemployable, basically. But, um, <laughs> no, I guess, um, uh, no, but I'm, you know, I could, I was kind of, there were two Toms, you know, there was a Tom that was like, oh my God, I can't believe this, you know, like we have to do all this work. And then the other Tom, which was, oh, of course, you know, of course we'll do that. Yeah. Um, and I think I just, yeah, it was a gradual, like eroding of a riverbank almost, you know, <laughs> shaping of the landscape. And I think that, that just happened. And I think only in, you know, someone said to me something recently, like, you know, when is a kettle hot? 
like it's only mm. hot in retrospective, mm. <laughs> you know. And I think that's the same with with this what, that question you asked. That it's probably only retrospective that we could probably pin when we like had a couple of bigger artists under our belt, and we had a few people that like maybe we didn't need the work yeah. so much. Mm. And I think there was a print project for a guy called or an estate of Richard Hamilton. And I remember that these people were really pushing us for doing because we did this great print for them. But, you know, it just wasn't the kind of art we were into. It was a bit more like kind of high street art sort of stuff. Um, mm. and, and that's cool. That's the whole world and people are super into that. Um, and I remember <laughs> saying, I love that you're not. I love that you're not. Yeah, that's we're not so into good. it. Yeah. <laughs> a guy Connor works for us. He's super into it. And loads of the artists we work with are super into it. But you've got to have your, you know, you've got to have your tastes. And I think, yeah, there was a time probably with that project where we said we can't do it. And then they were like, we'll wait. And we said, we can't do it for nine months. And like, we'll wait. Uh, oh, no, yeah. that's so bad. Um, um, and then we did, I had to just write an email basically being like, you know, look, it's been great, but um, we really <laughs> just don't want to do this project. Uh, and I think that was maybe it where um, actually no is a really positive word. Mm. Uh, my dad said that to me, actually, <laughs> you know, uh, because... I could let people walk all over me a bit, you know, and I, and I would deliver and I would do these things, but, um, but now I've got a team and my partner cat, I could never have scaled without her. Like she's amazing. And, um, you know, I couldn't do, I couldn't take these risks anymore. Right. Because, um, there's 12 other people to pay mm. and, yeah. and make sure that, you know, our partners are, are, um, are very happy. Yeah. I, I think, um, my view of the art industry got a little bit tarnished and it's good to see someone like you who's kind of like shunned it a little bit because mm. I used to have people come around with digital prints mm. and then say, can you embellish this edition? And I was like, yeah, like with screen print, I thought they wanted, but they were like, no, and here's a ketchup bottle of ink. And then I want you to go around the trees and like just what? put lines on all the trees. And I'm like, are you, are you joking? Like an art worker. This is like, yeah, is that, yeah. Is that like an art worker job? And I was yeah. like, what is this? Like, And then this is going in one of those high street galleries and it says hand embellished by the artist. It's not. It's, yeah. hand, it's by me with a ketchup bottle. It's yeah, like, I just mad. didn't see any anything that I wanted to be a part of in that. But I can see it with like the work that you're doing with all the varnishes and the... Actual, actual technical intricacies instead of stuff I mean, like that. Yeah, the art world is, um, you know, obviously I love it. Like I'm in it and we go to shows and, you know, it's brilliant. But, you know, it's like any industry, like it's incredibly sycophantic. Like I I think, yeah, we I guess we, we haven't shunned it. Like it's just that we have a kind of different take. Like I always say this about the printers at Make Ready. Like if you meet someone at a private view who works at Make Ready, one of the printmakers, you know, the first, like you start talking about printing, the first thing that they'll say most likely is like, I'm doing this print and it's, and it's got this many colors and it's got, it's really cool. And we've got this bit of machinery and like, yeah, this is, this, we had this really interesting problem the other day. Uh, who is it for? Oh, it's Fry Weiwei. You know, I find often when I meet printers from, from other studios or, mm. or gallerists or, you know, it's, um, how's your work going? Yeah, we are printing for X artists and Y artists and B artists and blah, 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 you know, and it's, mm. and I think that was, what I got very sick of um, because mm. it was just, especially like some of the bigger studios, like maybe had kind of fallen off the wagon a little bit, but, but they made prints for Damien Hurst and they make, so therefore they must, they must be good. Right. Mm. And, and I think that, that kind of compounds in galleries and they go, well, they must be, they must, they did it for this person. So they must be good. And I think that, I guess that's where we shunned it because we got quite sick of it. Like we just, like we literally started the business with absolutely nothing. Obviously things are very different now and, we partner with Avant Art and it's a very different iteration. Um, but we just had to be really good. Like we mm. did, that was it. Like I didn't come from money. Uh, I didn't go to the RCA. I didn't have lots of people I knew from the RA. Like, you know, I had a few connections, especially I must thank a guy uh, live on air <laughs> uh, <laughs> called Oliver Osborne because he was very helpful in more ways than he probably knows. Um, but he kind of made, we made work for him and it was art with a capital A, if you will, that's mm. a way of saying it, but he did open a few doors and, and we had that effect. Oh, well, they've made prints for, you know, for this person and, and therefore that snowboard. And then we made a print for Anthony Hamilton and then that, you know, and it went from there, but, but we never, we've never lost the fact that our product is amazing. Mm. Like I can stand here and just say, there's no doubt that we have one of the best fine art printed products. Yeah. on the planet and yeah. i hope we never lose that 
Um, and I think a lot of places have because they've almost, it's almost like they've never been challenged. Mm. Um, uh, but, you know, I love all those studios, you know, the, everyone's got their place, but um, yes, I agree with you. Like there is a, there's a part of the art world that leaves a sour taste. Um, and, you know, uh, you know what, actually, Tiger Woods said something. He, I mean, he's questionable <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he, five years ago, we could quote Tiger Woods yeah. whenever we so wanted. Five years ago. <laughs> that's, uh, no, but he, he so uh, separate the art from the artist, let's say. Mm. <laughs> he said, don't be bitter, be better. Mm. And I've always loved that. Like he would not be allowed to play at a certain course. And they said, you can't come to the clubhouse. And then first he did, he'd go and ask and say, yeah, no worries. Um, where's the first tee and what's the course record? You know, and that's that's literally what he did. And I'm not mm. saying we did Tiger Woods of of, of screen printing, but I thought I found that very inspirational that like you can, and I certainly did, damage my mental health quite a lot because I got quite caught up in being quite bitter mm. about it's like I'm gonna be quite frank, like quite bad, horrific experiences that I've had in other workplaces, like awful, you know. And, uh, and then in the, in the moment when I sort of said, you know what, like, it's, it's okay. And I had that self-compassion and, and met other people who, um, who actually came to join us from, from other places. And we said, you know what, let's just be better <laughs> mm. <laughs> because life's too short, you know, yeah. to piss off all the time, I guess. But yeah. Um, yeah. Um, shall I ask you some of the questions that I, so basically if you've already worked with the the top artists in the world like what is your five-year ambition for the studio because um, i know it's not about the artist but like how do you keep developing even when you're not pushed by the artists like mm -hmm. are you doing are you taking off time to research new inks and processes and pushing you yourself or are you finding problems and then trying to fix them on the fly yeah we yeah, um, it was a hard question to answer actually because, like, only very recently we have had these bucket list moments. I mm. mean, you know, I could say like, there's there's David Hockney is someone who I'd love to make prints with. You know, like we'd love to do a, a Francis Bacon, lip, you know, print oh state. You know, that would be amazing. Yeah. You know? Um, but I think those things. I mean, maybe not necessarily those things, but like more of those things will come. I think we're in a place now where we we will likely through our partnership with Avon Art we will make prints for these amazing people. And, and we have some, I can't divulge them, but we definitely have some incredible names mm. <laughs> coming and, that, and that's amazing. Um, but yeah, in terms of like pushing it and, and where we see ourselves in five years, I, I mean, we probably won't grow a lot more. Like I think there's a critical mass. Um, but I think I'd like to not think that the, 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 the rate of progression, if it does slow, it doesn't slow that much because mm. it, so every job we do, we're always asking the question, like, what can we do better? But we also understand the principle of diminishing return. Obviously, <laughs> you can't <laughs> change the settings all the time, but everyone has a notebook. We have these job sheets. When we weigh inks and we make colours, everything is written down. And it seems mm. really slow and anti-creative. Once you get good at it, you get quite quick at it. And you can go back, you can try, you can literally look at what you did two years ago. Mm. You can build hypotheses off them and go into the next print. And every single one is like 2% better, you know, 2% better. I mean, you look back and you think, oh my God, like, what did we do before? Yeah. Like, we didn't have Slack chat. What the hell were we doing? Like, how did we communicate? Or well, our job sheets were, well, they were one page, you know? Um, and people didn't carry notebooks around. You know, it's these tiny things. All that We used to print through, we used to think the highest mesh we had was a 120, you know? Mm. Um, and I think I'd like to see us continue that progression. And also something that's very dear to my heart is have the people that work with us also progress and push that and that's starting to happen starting to see little innovations very very make ready things we have these kind of 10 commandments if you will mm. um they're, they're very plain and, and nice they're not like the tom sacks yeah. <laughs> uh kind of, you know 10 bullets but um they they're things like everything matters that's one of them you know everything matters like doesn't matter if it seems superfluous write it down because you never know two years from now we go, oh my God, that thing that happened. So I'd like to think we we would have pushed a lot further. Um, you know, and we can't see where that is right now because it's in the future. Um mm. and I'd like to build careers for all our team. We have very different um, you know, I think the model of a lot of the other print studios, especially where I used to work, um, is you come in, you you do it for a bit, you sort of float around, but there's a bit of a ceiling. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to get a house or something like you kind of have to either do your own thing or leave. Yeah. You know? 
And but they are going to peel off. If you are you ready for them to start peeling off and making their own studios because you've trained them so well? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it, it happened with one guy down in Margate. Like it, it wasn't particularly. Insp- well, it was inspired by Make Ready. He didn't do it because of Make Ready, but yeah, he left. He was a freelancer and then he left and did something in, in Margate. And that's really cool. And I keep in touch with him and I gave him loads of inks and we send inquiries to him all the time. So I'm really embracing for anyone that wants to do their own thing. Uh, and we are actually literally demonstrating that as well. Mm. I think I think the thing about, yeah, I think some people will leave. Yeah, definitely. Like people leave, like that happens. Um, I think we're really about offering a career package and we're trying to kind of build that now like it's not quite where we want it to be but we have things like private healthcare we have like way more holiday than than average you know and then these mm. things come through our partnership with that with Avon Art and you know um because the vision that we had for Maker Ready is much greater than a small tiny business that was just owned by a guy that started in his garage you know mm. um so yeah people will leave and they will do their own things and we're already very supportive of that um and if people do it in the future you know you, you can't get in between that you know i mm. left <laughs> yeah to do my own thing so but i also think that the core team that we have know that or i'd like to think you know they know that like realistically if you do your own thing like there's not probably going to be another make ready for 30 years, you know, it may never be one again because you had, you know, Coriandu, K2, you have Jealous, you know, and then there hasn't really been anything else mm. at all. Like there's mm. been other little things, but then we came along very out of left field. So I think a lot of the people that we have actually are quite keen on staying because they understand they're like, well, if I want to print with the best equipment, like this is it, you know, because... Yeah one of the team of machines, you know, is, is 150 K mm. <laughs> you're not going to go and buy one of those. Whereas, um, but some people have the, you know, they just want to make prints on a hand bench. Like we had a guy, Rory, he was such a great printer mm. and it's always those people that leave. Uh, he was absolutely <laughs> fantastic. He was so good. And he printed on, uh, on a hand bench quite a bit and he absolutely nailed it. And he, and he left to do something else, work for another artist and, and, and ultimately make his own work. So yeah, yeah, very, very encouraging of that. And um, that's life, you know. Mm. Do you ever like think, do you dabble in your own artwork? And like, because you've got all the contacts and you've got the machines, like, are you an artist in your own right, do you think? Or do you love the technician side of it? Um, no, I mean, I studied graphic design and, and mm. did illustration and I used to draw a lot. Yeah, I used to, I fancy myself as an artist, I guess. Uh, I still have some drawings online. Hello, I'm oh, sorry, murphytom.com. Still, still, <laughs> still pay for that even though I don't draw at all, but I love drawing. Drawing was my thing. I, I, I did a bit of printing and, and then I moved into printing for other people. So I, I don't do it, unfortunately, anymore um, because I'm so engrossed in art all the time. Mm. And yeah, I could, I have these connections, I guess now, but um, I don't know. I, I'm trying to think how to say this, like offending people that may listen to this. They're like, I think sometimes when, you know, you know, all these people and, and you make a print and then like you can get, you can basically get it in a group show in a gallery. Mm. Doesn't make you an artist. I, I think. Oh, I've got a good thing for it. So like I can get in a size 12 trousers, but it doesn't mean I can't, I should. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I like yeah. just because I can physically like drag yeah. those on doesn't mean I should walk around in them. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, yeah. also as well, like, if someone makes room, that's fine. You know, if they want to try those trousers on, that's fine. Um, but I am, um, I think for me, like I needed something, something else, you know, um, and I, I actually stopped playing golf. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm like, I went to art school, you know, like I not a jock. I yeah. was not in the sports team at school, <laughs> but dude, golf is so sick. I don't think jocks <laughs> play golf, Tom. I don't think that's they a- do. They definitely do. They- do. Uh, I didn't realize that they did. Oh, uh, in okay. America, they did. <laughs> okay. Yeah, in America. Uh, in, in, in England, it's different. But no, mm. it, that's 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 my thing. Okay. Um, and I, I, it's something that I didn't think it was, and it's actually very new and modern. And um, yeah, that's my fix. <laughs> yeah. Um, can, can you tell me about this? It's like a really broad topic, but like papers and things. Mm. Are you are you seeing like technology in papers, or do you do you always kind of like go back to the to the more like handmade ones or what are, what are artists yeah. requesting at the moment with that type of um, thing? Yeah. I mean, again, because we, 
we're quite opinionated about what we should do. But people might see this as like, oh, it's really boring. Like, you know, you don't, you only use, kind of, we only kind of use like one type of paper. They, they haven't been to John Purcell if they think paper's boring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we love John. I mean, we, we, there was a significant increase in how much paper we were buying. We buy the pallet load now. Oh my God. Stuff called yeah. Somerset Top Size. And we had to buy mm. that by four Yes. <laughs> I found we, that it's so good. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, no, we buy. Um, it's quite cool. We have our own like massive storage area, and we mm. any one time we have like maybe eight or ten pallets of it, and wow. we do burn through it. And really, that's what we use. We use that in the six hundred GSM because our press parameters and all our curves um, for our films and our output and, and our and the fingerprints of all our presses are all basically calibrated for that. So if we want right. to make if we want to do a print that looks like watercolor paper, like we will print that so in such high fidelity that will trick you into thinking that is on songs. <laughs> However, uh, we have printed for, we did something for the Tate, um, and this one called Vivian Suter, and we printed on this Cardi um, Indian paper. And that was really cool. And we just didn't change the settings at all. We kind of went for it. So a lot of artists that we work with are really do just want to go with what we think, but we, we can right. use textured stuff. We did loads of stuff for House and Worth, and that was on like a textured paper for this guy, uh, the estate of Chilida. Um, you know, I'm not, I used to print for a lot of graphic designers and every graphic designer would be like, oh, have you heard of G.S. Smith? Yeah. <laughs> have you heard of Colour Plan? Like, yes, know, I've we'll, heard of Colour Plan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we'll you know, we'll, we'll print that colour. And I think, I get when we stopped using water base actually as well, we could do these massive flood coats mm. of totally flat, mm. any finish that you want colour. You know, and and I think that's when, and also our formats are much bigger. You can't buy Color Plan or Peregrine and Majestic or uh, Plike, um, you know, at two meters by one point four uh, five. You know, you yeah. just can't buy it in a flat sheet like that. Mm. Yeah, no, I just I saw one of your videos on your Instagram of one of the women who worked for you, and she's printing this giant red square, and I I, I, I just yeah. had like flashbacks to me yeah. trying to print perfect squares on paper but can you explain like why tub size works do they like wet it and then dry it and then pre-wet it and then dry it or is there some kind of process there where it doesn't absorb the ink as much as the other papers or something like that yeah i guess it has a really good surface stability um mm. you know the, the shape you know we, something we we're very keen on is like the shape of the dot like we really mm. like to control not only the spread of the dot but the shape of the dot and tub size is just this perfect marriage between you know it's a fine art 100 cotton paper that that doesn't yellow and blah 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 uh, and you know essentially a coated stock which everything would look amazing on and the dot wouldn't spread at all and mm. you know um you print on newsprint like everything that's really great and sharp on newsprint yeah. um so uh, i mean you have to speak to john really but um you know he he's a chemist that's what he studied he studied chemistry Mm. Uh, and he would really know about it. And I think tubs, I, as far as I'm aware, when I spoke to him, we started buying a lot of it, he was talking to me about it. Um, I think they basically, I think this is a story, <laughs> uh, they basically helped create it with yeah. uh, um, St. Cuthbert's Mill. So I think Coriander were well, trying to make a print for maybe Peter Blake or something, and they and they were having this distort, um, you know, this distortion uh, mm. that was happening because you can get stretched and things like that. And I think, I think John was involved with St. Cuffers Mill to basically create a solution for this for this dimensional stability. And, and as far as I'm aware, it's, it's sized yeah. in the tub and it goes mm. through this tub mm. and it's internally and surface sized with this kind of starchy um, thing. Uh, I don't, that's where my chemistry yeah. is. Um, and I think that's basically, that's why it's like that. But in, inter interestingly, actually, it still takes on water. So when mm. we went to our studio, you know, it was very moist and we, we, we're sorting that out now. And we actually laminated, well, we coated the back. Yes, I've heard about that. That's with, so um, clever. Yeah, with U, uh, Marabou UBC ink. And we just cured it, uh, flashed it through the dryer. Um, it mitigates uh, 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 water content. You know, the thing about mm. water content in paper, especially large paper, um, you know, if it it's not if it's moist in there or or, or, it's, or it's hot, that that's kind of okay. It's if the relative humidity changes mm. a lot because you know paper is hy hygrophobic. 
Um, mm. I might like that the other day. And so is abortion. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It will, it will absorb, it will, exactly, yes. Uh, it will absorb moisture um, and it can permanently deform as well. And that's why, obviously, you know, we don't use water-based things. So they're really great. I mean, I got into screen printing with water-based things. They're amazing, but you just can't mm. do what you can do with solvents and UV on, on that paper because you can cake it on, basically. Um so yeah, that's that, that's why we use that stock. I think I think that's how it works. Um, but it still will change. So we we definitely take other measures. We actually wrap all of our prints. So at the end, they they just fall into a tray with this with this wrapping, and wrap them up to keep the RH relatively the same. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if we were on a, we never really flatten prints, but if there was a very moist day and there was a varnish on there or really thick, if there's like 30 layers that made it black, you know, because these rich blacks in that way, mm-hmm. and the paper deformed. We might crush them under weight and put them in a room and then um, suck, suck, but just a de- domestic dehumidifier, just yeah. get rid of all the moisture. And honestly, they perfectly deform and they go back <laughs> flat. And it's, you know, and I just read that in a book. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. I've I've had to do that when uh, the customer's coming the next day. You're just like yeah, exactly. right? yeah. everything is going on these prints to flatten the shit out of them. Yeah. I know you read yeah. it in a book, which is more romantic, but the the, <laughs> the, the stress of trying to find things that yeah, are heavy yeah. enough to go on that's really funny. Um, God, there's there's lots of technical things I want to ask you about. I have not printed with UV inks, and I'm mm-hmm. now I'm like even more gutted that I haven't had that experience. But per layer, do you have to cure? in between each layer like fully or do um, you just kind of is there a way of like get, is it like um plaster link where you get it to a certain temperature and mm. it's like touch dry but not fully cured and like how yeah, do you it, do it, that it like plaster, mm-hmm. plaster so yeah um uh, yeah so uh uv because yeah it's extremely interesting ink it was invented in, in i think in the 70s and there was this big push in, in la actually lots of graphics and poster printers and there was this like uh, los angeles you know, um, environmental act or something that came in and people were kind of really or maybe it was in the 80s but pioneering these these inks because they are way more eco-friendly um, and they they work in this really clever way, you know, where you can cure them. You know, mm. they're amazing. You know, um, and then lots has happened since that time as well. So yes, you can now flash them. Like we have different dry settings on dryers. You can, you know, it's it's like cooking. It's like mm. you know, with UV, it's like you go through very fast. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It depends what you ink you're using, but like you go through very quickly uh, in our parameters with, with a very, uh, l- relatively low, um, UV light, um, that's emitting a particular wavelength that that's very important. Your reflectors are very clean and things like that. Um, or you can kind of overcook it a little bit. And we did that on this, I keep mentioning this Christian Rex moment print, but it has this pitting and all this kind of almost like old canvas texture in the dark mm. areas. And we did that by we basically messed it up. Yeah. Uh, and we went, oh, that looks really good. Uh, so <laughs> we did that by over and under curing the ink, basically. Mm. Um, so yes and no. Um, but you yes, really, if, if you don't cure it, it will be wet mm. effectively forever. And it's not forever, yeah. but effectively forever. So sometimes you might, you know, if you over cure it though, you won't get the interlayer adhesion that you want. Mm. And the thing is about the way we're using UV inks, all our inks that we use are they're all industrial inks for coating plastic and metal and glass. You know, they're not art inks at all. Mm. And they're not designed to print on paper. Um, you know, we bring Marigou up and, and this woman, Andrea. They're, they're like, like, what do you do with these you know, things? Like, you can't do that, you know. But no, they love it though as well. Um, you know, I think they find that interesting that we kind of just play around with it. And that, and a lot of other, you know, were inspired by people like Coriander. They did the same thing. You know, they used these kind of vinyl inks, you know. Mm. Um so yeah, you you have to cure it um, definitely. Um, you, different inks will require like different time. But you, rule of thumb, it's there is a rule of thumb. Um, you know, it, it's amazing. It polymerizes. It doesn't dry. Mm, mm. It, you know, the it's like emulsion. It's the same principle. The low weight oligos and monomers in the in the in the resin uh, become unstable under actinic light, and they and they form a polymer chain. I mean, you can't fuck with that you know yeah. it's, it's hard as nails uh, <laughs> you can make it matte if you want to make it matte you can matte over it you know you can this stuff called the UVSM from mm. uh, Arabu and it is the mattest ink you've ever seen in your entire life it's yeah just... <laughs> is that is that kind of like playing with do you know that that the blackest black ink and all that type of thing have you been asked to print with any of those types of things because certainly like specially developed pigments yeah. and colors like that. um yeah i know i know there's the um uh yeah, the blackest black and there's this pinkest pink i saw this 
Stuart Semple guy made. And um, I mean, not, not really. Like, I guess we've kind of avoided that stuff because like we can make a really, really strong black. And, you know, the Vanta black, I think maybe what we're talking about is um, that insane black. Mm. Uh, and the thing about Vanta black, I was re- reading about it, it's actually grown on the surface of an object. Um, and it's mm. tiny, tiny little rods, I think microscopic that, absorb uh, uh, r- light r- radiation <laughs> yeah exactly and to dissipate its heat energy uh, and you, you touch it you, you look at it and you speak about it in the wrong way and it scratches you know uh, <laughs> so yeah we have you know what we do do a lot of is like like glitter like i know lots of places have done that but yeah. like we have done these massive glitter prints for boy george he was an amazing client he's someone we really work with and he came to us with an ipad drawing and he, we were the first people to ever make prints for him and uh, and I, he said, what, what do you think I should do? And, I, and it was this picture of David Bowie. And I said, it should be massive and it, it should be glitter. Yeah. And he was like, you seem to know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you're just finding glitter on your face for like months. Yeah, it was everywhere. Just... I think we put nine colours on one print. Oh, and God. And we just up against each other. And, and we hit every every colour like two or three times. And sometimes different colours over the top of each other. And so we, we go a bit crazy with that, really. Um, we, we love, you know varnishes with sparkles in them uh you know we, we work very uh, we buy a lot of powders from this place called the Merck group in in, in um in, i think in switzerland i'm not quite sure um and they have loads of like cool powders but really our thing is the printed dot you know mm. we we will put a finish on there and whatnot but like if you see so some, some of the prints that we've made the illusion of printmaking, but someone might say they look flat. And I say, you just go on our website. I mean, these definitely aren't flat. You, know, mm. you can see that there's a one from Scott Kahn that we did that's on our website. There's the scratches in it. Yeah, not, yeah, exactly. And like, you can see the paint. It's, it's mm. insane. You know, you have these areas of 2000% ink density against areas of 0%. Um, that's what we're excited about. I think we, we yeah. want to get to that rather than lots of finishes and gold leaf and stuff. There, there is one thing which I do kind of want to cling on to is like printing by hand or even just in a less mechanical way is like, is that the, the prints are different print to print in the edition. Mm-hmm. So like the print that I get is number one of 50 is different from the 50, 50. So mm-hmm. like, do you feel like you've lost that kind of variation in between the different prints in the edition? Or no, there's, there's variation. No, there is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, there is semi auto. You remember, mm. remember that? You know, it's, it's not full auto. Um, it's semi automated. It's assisted. You know, it's, it's assisted. Um, you know, it's like in Zelda when you get, uh, I think you get these like bracelets and you can like lift bigger rocks. <laughs> you know, that is, Link is still lifting those rocks. He's mm. still, you know, that, that's what it is. It, it is literally a, a, a semi automated. So there's definitely variation. It just allows like consistency. It allows you to come in and make these like awesome prints, like with the glitter, mm. you know, these massive things. And we were printing like layer, we were doing it again, putting it underneath. And we have some interns with us saying, what the hell is going on? Like, this is mental. But, and then print the, the machine crushes down, you know, yeah. and, and you're utilizing a tool, you know, we, uh, we're not just guessing. There's not a button on it that just says print, you know, no. there is a button that says print, but it, it, like you have to set that button up, <laughs> um, you know? Um, so no, no, I, no, I think that it is there. Uh, and you, you only have to go to New York and, and meet people like Lisa Davies, um, you know, and, and brand X I've never met them, but um I love to when I'm next there, and I'm really inspired by them as well. They they do they do hand printing without a doubt. They've got semi autos. They, they've all got semi autos. This really big thing in America, mm. um, you know. So you know, I met this guy Alexander Henrici, who was one of Warhol's printers. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I went to New York. I met him just before he retired. He actually gave his studio away to, uh, to someone who's now called Pegasus Prints. So um, and all his equipment, which was super kind of him. Mm. Um, I don't know then, but um, I met Alexander and. Um, yeah, he had a semi-auto at the back. He's been running that for yeah. you know, 30 years. He also had a hand bench uh, and it was super bodge. He had these wooden screens with like Basquiat written on the side and he had all these, mm. these films that Basquiat had drawn and it was just mine. That's incredible. That was just, yeah. just like one Nick one. <laughs> just... Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, there's, there's so many different things I can ask you about. When you're like exposing your screens and things, because of the sheer size of them, are you finding that... Are you thinking about like laser to screen technology or are you thinking about like, are you still doing them with films or how are you doing that bit? I mean, we've pushed, and I know this, like inkjet film 
to this limit. Like mm. there are people that use uh, old school image set of films that are lasered onto like recording films, a place called Hexia, actually brilliant guys that do it in Southeast London. We can get a finer dot with inkjet film mm. in our studio because yeah. we understand fundamentally how exactly to make a screen properly. I, I'm mm. not, you know, I could, could demonstrate it. You know, I'm, I'm mm. not a lot of people with mm. PowerPoint presentation, but but they do uh, hold on to that, don't they? With the those old school machines. So it's like, yeah, and, and that's the problem. I think like mm. people think, oh, if some guys work call it a proper film, and I'm like, well, all you need to do is get an intimate contact between your emotional blah blah. blah you know, yeah. uh, but later <laughs> to screen, yeah, a hundred million percent. Like if like when when it's more affordable, like I would love it, but the people that um, they're making it for t-shirt printers, aren't they? Aren't they? About money now for us, um, mm. you know, would never sign that off, you know, um, because we are doing great work with the stuff that we have. Yeah, mm. obviously you don't have film. I mean, that would be amazing. You know, we spend ages, um, you know, we get films out of our film prints and we actually calibrate them so they fit perfectly before they even go on the screen, you know, because mm. we're doing prints sometimes that are, 1.5 meters wide or something um and yeah we, we when we exposed it yeah i mean we've just got it down like we've just got it down i went to uh well we, we know keywell um and uh um we went to i went ages ago a uh, guy chris malpas very important man in my life uh he took me years and years ago to uh, mcdermott autotype who effectively mm. invented emulsion yeah so, i went there Direct, yeah. bit. They've I mean, got some very boring business rooms, but yeah, yeah they, exactly. they show you around and stuff. Yeah, I went to the lab, yeah, and, went mm. and talked about it. And I got this book from this guy, Chris, he gave me a book, and I absolutely digested it back to front. And it just just old school. It's mm. a trade. It's a yeah. trade. Like it is literally a trade, like plumbing's a trade, like, being an electrician's a trade. So we we just got it down. Like we haven't got, yeah, the perfect, 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 perfect setup, but we do have a set of controls. Uh, I mean, broadly speaking, like parameters mm. of control, we have the extraction. It's a particular relative humidity in the area where the screens dry and they dry like that. And they, and all the moisture comes out of the film with the emulsion. So we don't get, we do get pinholes obviously because we're human, but we don't get as many because we've diagnosed those issues. Now, when we expose the screen, it falls out of the mesh, mm. just it falls out of the mesh and it's perfect. I mean, obviously, there's a there's a skill element. The guy Paul uh, who works with us, he's he's absolutely fantastic at this. Um, but it's chemistry; you can't mess with it. It is mm. about control. We have an automatic coating machine now. We actually recently acquired that for pennies. Really? Uh, yeah, because mm. no one else can like use it. <laughs> yeah, no one can use it, and a lot. I think a lot of people just don't see the value in it. But like, honestly, like just every screen we make now is exactly the same the r the eom is the same the rz is the same which is the roughness and eom is the emulsion over mesh uh, the thickness of the stencil mm. um it's another thing that is no longer a variable and you just keep chipping away at these things and you it's not that like you know someone who was maybe a skeptic would see this machine and, and it, it would fall the mesh would um be exposed and it wash it out and they go oh i don't know it's a difference <laughs> But you do when mm. all of these tiny, tiny things are just conglomerated together. Mm. And then you only have to go on our website and see the control that we we inert um, or assert, mm. sorry, over, over the process. Mm. Um, and it also, I'll tell you what, makes your life a lot easier. You can blast through. It coats both sides at the same time, but one just after another. So it does two coats. You can do any program you want. Mm. Um, you have to come see it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, we've... I've, I've been a nerd at uh, McDermott as well, but it's gone now, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we. I think it got bought out though. by someone else, and then they all just. Oh, well, my contacts yeah. just fizzled out. Yeah, it's sad yeah. to see stuff like that because they used to genuinely send people out to the studios to yeah. talk about the emulsion yeah. and teach you about it and that type yeah. of thing. Yeah, well, you're mm. right. It's dying. You know, it is. It is dying. But there's a few people out there. I tell you what, Marabou in the UK, I mean, Marabou, a German company, and um, they, guy Carson, Andrea, I mean, they've been in printing for years, mm. and they got us in touch with like people like Keywall, people like that, you know, um, they, they're they really good. People at like Grunig, you know, Grunig is the auto coder that we have, um, you know, you know, hit them up, you know, they, they, they are very passionate, they're still around, they're still going, you know, printing is strong, mm. you know, so print isn't dead, it's like, no, it's not, it's just... Yeah. It's, wrapped up in some fifth spatial dimension that is mm. just quite hard to get to now but it's yeah. it's still there you know yeah um, i think i think that's why the nft artists are reaching out to you because 
there's something in people's psyche where they don't value the digital yet. Mm. And they don't really believe in scarcity and digital like products. Even if you have got like this kind of back like barcode of where it was made and like when it was made on the blockchain and stuff. So they do want, they're reaching out and they do want t-shirts of their NFTs. They do want like tattoos of their NFTs. They do want physical merch to go alongside it to kind of give that scarcity in real life again. So I feel like that's that's a huge market. And if you're already tapped into it with that with them, um, no, that's really going to be, yeah. yeah, it's really interesting people, part of it. Like well, someone we've done a lot of prints called um, Nina Chanel Aubrey. Uh, she's super cool. I mean, we're doing loads of prints with her now. It's, it's all live now. Um, I think you still get them. Um, some people who have NFTs already can like mint them essentially. I mean, they're minted, but like they can essentially get one in real life. Mm. You, know, um, you know, that's pretty cool. Some people choose not to. I think Damien Hurst did something called Currency, uh, yeah. which, was, which, was, which was a similar thing. I think that was a bit more of like an experiment. Uh, it felt a bit more, I don't know, it felt a bit more like a, almost like a protest in some way as well. But <laughs> uh, Whereas um, a lot of the NFT artists are really excited. People have a choice as well. You know, do you want an NFT or do you want a physical thing? Yeah. If, have whatever you want, you know. Yeah. Um, but and you burn it and then you get the real one. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm. Um, I yeah. think, yeah, well, at least you're open to it and staying current with the idea and you're not blocked out with like, oh, no, mm-hmm. digital's not for me. Have you have you had to marry the two yet? Have you had to do like a digital print and then screen print over the top? Yeah, always. Like we call always. them prints. Like yeah. we a UV flatbed digital printer. Um, we absolutely embrace digital processes. I mean, it's why we pushed our film positive so far because mm. the guy who came from Keywell, you know, he saw them and was like, I literally can't believe you're exposing this onto your, your meshes, you know. And so, so we do the same thing. We profile all our media, all our paper with a spectrometer. Um, you know, we, we really, really go. I mean, there's lots of great people that do that, you know. Um, mm. uh, but we we really embrace the other. Yeah, and the great thing about UV flatbed is it has a layer it has an x and y zero point so you can screen print easy more easily onto it mm. uh, we're doing some prints for a guy called um well, a guy we call matsu he's this japanese artist great artist um and that's a like a g clear and aqueous ink jet um you know uh print and then silk screen over and yeah it's a great way we, we do a lot of prints like that mm. uh, it's a really fantastic way especially for someone who maybe you know, can't do a screen print right now or their work maybe hasn't evolved to that point. Um, we do digital prints all the time. You know, it's classic digital print and a varnish, you know, it's, mm. uh, <laughs> yeah. it's never gets old. Yeah. Um, have you, did you say you had another unpopular opinion in the screen print industry, not the art industry? Yeah, I guess, um, I guess I touched on it before, but uh, I guess, uh, you, know, you know, to be, I think I've come up against criticism where, you know, we're very clean, we're very measured, we write things down, you know, you know, we measure, we literally measure like inks when we're like, if we're making a color for someone, like we, we will be like on the scales and we, we got to learn all these tricks how to do it quickly, actually f- from Marabou. Again, mm. old, we're just talking to them. We have to make inks every day, you know, um, you know, to, to be clean and to be scientific is, is creative. Mm. I think t- to me, that is creativity. Mm. utterly science and creativity are the same thing they're just spinning at very very high energy you know and they, mm. you know they are two sides of the same coin um and and, and it can be a bit unpopular because i think people think oh well you know, if it's not a messy studio and you're not you're basically not open to experimentation you know blah 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 um you know you, you, maybe our prints are a bit flat a bit boring it's just not the case at all like you know, you build upon the shoulders of everyone before you, you know, and mm. I think that's that's the culture that we're developing. So yeah, slightly unpopular opinion that, you know, we've gone off and got semi automated machines and solvent inks and UV inks. And actually like people who make quite stern opinions about those things often are people that actually have no idea. Mm. Um, so yeah, I don't think you have to print it by hand for it to be handmade. Basically, I actually fundamentally <laughs> completely disagree with it. Um, and, and I'd be willing to, you know, really debate that with with, with people, um, uh, and, and not in an aggressive way. Uh, more, um, yeah. that's what it's about: is having a conversation about it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I guess that can be pretty unpopular. Um, sometimes artists are like, "But is it handmade?" And they're looking at this like incredible print. Mm. But we don't tend to get that in, anymore. But yeah, if that had to be it, I guess that would be it. Mm. Yeah, I like that. That's a really I, the one thing that you said today is just that thing about 
everyone always cites Warhol and you're like, yeah, but he was using the most advanced technology. Yeah, he had, yeah. Yeah. It was like, yeah. this is his thing <laughs> and it's really cool. And it's like, amazing. Let's, let's use it, you know. And screen printing as well. Like screen printing is so modern. It's, <laughs> it's modernity in print. Yeah, you've got 3D printing now, but like if you think about screen printing, what it really is, people who want to have more history than there really is, we'll say it's thousands of years old and it's invented in China. But let's be frank. Yeah. Screen printing is about 120 years old. Yeah, really. where the emulsion. Uh, yeah, <laughs> emulsion, uh, yeah, direct emulsion as well. Like mm. Actual, mm. Emulsion, or not, not indirect stencils, mm. and, uh, capillary form. Like that direct emulsion was invented by a general type in the 70s. So, yeah. you know, and everything is screen printed. The motherboard in your iPhone is screen printed. Mm. The um, solar panels are screen printed. You know, it is everywhere. And you know what? Maybe a good thing to end on, but um, someone from Marabou said to me, um, you know, the thing about screen printing is it's not really an industry. It's a technology utilized by many industries. Mm. And that's what it is. That's why people have a hard time sort of understanding it because, you know, if you ever in a car and you see that walnut effect, that kind of wood effect, do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, you see that. I didn't know that is a screen print, UV ink, very high meshes made in a factory somewhere some person who's just, that's just their job. And they just, they just do that on the factory line and it's part of a manufacturing process. And then it's molded and it looks so weird. It looks like wood. Mm, mm. Um, and it's just part of that Nat graph um, in, in Nottingham, you know, we buy these dryers off them. A lot of their stuff is the medical industry. They're printing yeah. diabetes tabs, you know, and then they have to be cured at a particular temperature. It is gigantic. It is a mm. massive industry and it's those people. And it's often those types of printers that you meet are the ones that have the best ideas. And to be honest, overcome most of the problems because they're going mm. in every day, like that great carpenter, that great plumber, that great electrician, that great printer, you know, and they've just solved it all, but they just mm. disappear into obscurity because they're not, they don't know this gallerist and that gallerist. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not sharing the information. <laughs> <not>. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They might not even be passionate about it. They're just really good at it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's brilliant, Tom. Thank you so much for your time. I've got no, loads no, of thanks. questions, but I feel like, yeah, people need to absorb this and then look at your <laughs> images and your videos of like the artwork and just understand it from that perspective as well. <laughs> Maybe I've got to like interview you in a, in a year or something <laughs> and then we can ask fresh questions from audience yeah. members and stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks so much for having me on. I mean, it's a really cool podcast. I listened to a few of them and just hearing the different, um, you know, opinions, some of those t-shirt printers you were talking to, like, you know, we don't have some of those problems. And it's just quite nice to know that like, that literally, like I was saying, like, you know, mm. we do two different jobs sometimes, but we use the same technology. Mm. I think, you know, we, I think the, the, it doesn't, everyone needs to come closer together and uh, yeah. there's not a lot of us. And I think your podcast is, um, is really mm. cool for that. So, um, yeah, it's just Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. I'll speak soon. Cheers. Bye.